as I was saying, thank you very much for having me. The three kilometers distance between the University of Haifa and the Technion are filled with uh, security checkpoints and that sort of stuff preventing people from going from one place to the other. And this is always fun to have uh, a legitimate reason to enter through the Technion security. Um, seriously though, th uh, thank you very much for staying for the last talk of the day and the week. And I know that you had a very uh, rough week filled with lots of lots of technical details and ideas and concepts. So I'm going to give you sort of a high level talk complaining from the bottom of my heart and the cryptographic community's uh, knowledge of why security engineers screw things up. Terribly sorry for that. But at the end, if you look at it very carefully, the consumers of cryptography, unlike many other research directions, are not the end users. For example, face recognition people, the people who use at the end the algorithms are those who are playing Xbox and Wii and all these sort of things. But the consumers of cryptography, the cryptography that we generate in academia, the cryptography that we generate in research institutes, are not the end users. These are security engineers. Many of you are probably security engineers, which is good. However, there is a huge gap between what the academia knows and does and tries to promote and what security engineers are doing. And this is sort of a call for bridging the gap. So if you look very carefully, since the 70s when cryptography became modern and uh, civilian, you know, we, have, we still have armies and NSA and all this sort of uh, jazz going on, in the real life, in the modern civil life, we hit this cryptopia. You want to encrypt data? Here, there is a list of algorithms. Okay, we don't really like this because it was designed in IBM, a secret process. Okay, but we have AES. If you don't like AES, we have Serpent. You don't like Serpent, you have RC4. You don't like RC4, just pick. We have many good ciphers. They went through lots of public uh, evaluation, both implementation-wise and security-wise. The design criteria of AES, you're invited to download the, the AES submission, Randall submission, and read what, what was the rationale for all the constants they, they have picked. And today we can encrypt, if you have the AES NI instruction set on your uh, Intel Core i5, i7, you can encrypt in less than one cycle per byte. It takes less time to encrypt your data using AES, then to access it from L1 cache. We should be in this golden era of cryptography. This is not the bottleneck. It was never the bottleneck, but seriously, now it's not the bottleneck. Public key cryptography, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, elliptic curves. We heard quite a lot from Nadia about the lengths of the key, and you know there are always issues, but you don't like them, okay, go to, elliptic curves. You don't like them? We have lattice-based crypto systems. We have multivariate systems. We have things that will work even if they are going to be quantum computers. We are ready for that. Just waiting for people to start using the huge volume of results that we have in our community. Zero knowledge proofs. Another concept which cannot happen and somehow it works. Secure multi-party computation. Again, Things that, if you asked people 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd ask them, would it be possible to solve the dining cryptographer's problem? Well, they didn't know what the problem is, but they would have conjectured that it's not as easy. And of course, today we have the solution to all your problems, the homomorphic encryption. Um, so this is a golden era. And still, despite all this, you can say, okay, but something is missing. Okay, you have a good block cipher, but do you know how to use it? Do you have good modes of operation? The answer is yes, we have great modes of operation. NIST had a competition just after the AES process of selecting a good uh, mode of operation. So we have counter mode, we have Galois counter mode, which is also authenticated. We have many things. 
If you go today to any crypto conference, we live in the world where all the problems were solved. You just security engineers need to come and speak with us. Tell us, look, we have this problem. What sort of an algorithm we should use? I think there are very few cases of, of all the times I was asked by people from the industry, what should I use? That I had no idea where the result is. We already have the full infrastructure. You're discussing smart cards. OK, we have resettable zero knowledge for smart cards with no memory and no volatile. We have everything. Just ask and start using it. Uh, there are a few small limitations. For example, if you use public key crypto systems, then there is an inherent privacy problem. Okay, but we're also understanding these sort of things. And despite all my complaints, you know, we're surrounded by cryptography, starting from SSL and TLS. I guess all of you have used it at least once in the last few days. If you're surfing now uh, the web instead of listening to my boring talk, then you're probably using also one of these things. IPsec, VPNs, uh, mobile communications. I guess all of you have, are in the possession of at least one mobile phone, statistically. Um, software that arrives today to your computer is signed, right? Even if you use Windows, even if you use Linux, even if you use Mac OS, everything is signed. Android is signed. Uh, iOS is signed. Everything is signed. Life is great. I mean, if you look at it very carefully, life should be amazing. Today you can sign digitally on documents. Also in, in Israel, in Taiwan, in many countries, you can sign legally using digital signatures. It's binding, binding a signature. We know how to do bidding on sugar bits in a secure, and this is a, an example of a secure multi-party computation that actually went out and was used. They could prove that the system works and it actually worked. Electronic elections, but also you can see it in car ignition. And you can see it in updating of pacemakers. And all these security problems should disappear, right? I mean, here you have this huge pile of cryptographic primitives and solutions. Here is how they're already being used. And somehow, despite all the efforts of everyone, we're still stuck with viruses, introsions, and worms. But all the software that runs on my computer can be authenticated. I can check that it's, it's supposed to be there. So we have the solution and still the problem exists. If you listen very carefully to the internet traffic, most of it is not encrypted. Now, of course, if you post everything on Facebook, okay, you don't really have to encrypt it because the adversarial model is such that. But people are not using encryption, even when it's essential. Uh, most communication is not even authenticated, which is even worse because at the end, you're getting data from somewhere, and you have no idea what's going on. The infrastructure of the internet is not protected well enough. DNS security, DNSSEC is not used. And you heard from Amir some of his complaints. We have the solution, but no, the solution is too complicated. So we have still problems with user authentication, and most of the people do not encrypt their hard drives. And when they do encrypt their hard drives, they're using weak passwords or they use their fingerprints, and something is not ticking correctly. So I would like to introduce the two players, because this is a cryptographic talk in the computer security uh, venue. So we'll introduce our players. The first one is the security engineer. Please meet Matt. Um, he went to a very good university, very good school, did his uh, his degree in either CS or electrical engineering or math. A decent guy, got very good grades, by the way. He's looking for a job, if you're interested. Um, he took some courses in cryptography and computer security. And he works for a good company, a respectable company. And all in all, the guy knows what he's doing. The second player of this talk is Chris. This is a world-renowned researcher in cryptography 
did his PhD under an even more distinguished researcher, who goes to all the fancy conferences that we have. I mean, fancy, you know, if you've ever been to Crypto or Eurocrypt, this is not fancy, but this sort of thing. He's involved in the computer security uh, community. He's also doing some consulting on the side, you know, just to... Uh, to, <laughs> to somehow survive on a professorship uh, and that sort of stuff. And he was even Matt's teacher. Uh, so if you want to think of him as a descriptographer, you can do it. Now, I just want to share before I start a very quick personal anecdote. There is this RSA conference. I don't know if you've ever been to it. RSA is a huge 10,000 people going there, huge conference with 20 tracks, parallel tracks, litigation, law and legal aspects of security and privacy issue and hacking and user and personal development, many tracks. One of them is the cryptographer's, cryptographer's track. Um, and you go there, there's also a trade show. Most of the people go to the tra for the trade show. And you enter CTRSA, the cryptographer's track of RSA for the first time. The first talk, the room, which is the smallest, is fully packed. Now, all the talks, there is a schedule, and all the talks are marked, either beginner, intermediate, advanced. And the room is packed, even though this is an advanced talk, highly technical talk, research papers. And you see the entire audience listening, waiting to hear what's going to be on stage. Now, most of these people are security engineers. They are the security crypto gurus of their respective companies. They read Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography, and therefore they are the gurus of their companies. They came there, they're sitting, and the first talk goes online. This was a, uh, it was around Trummer speaking about some side channel attacks on AES, cache attacks, I will mention them a bit later. And you know, these people, they sit there, they enjoy the talk, they understand most of it, uh, there are small technical details, uh, okay, they got the hang of it and you know, it's an advanced, they successfully finished the first talk. Second talk, I go on stage, related key impossible differential of reduced round AES 192. I think that even in this audience, most people don't really want to know the details of the paper correct me if I'm wrong, including myself. And you can see their eyes that used to be very lit and very happy. You know, we are the crypto gurus. We read Bruce Schneier's book. We know everything. Slowly closing. And their faces changes to a complete shock. What the hell is going on? And after five minutes, the hall is mostly empty. The second, the second round of talks in this uh, track usually contains only uh, cryptographers. And I've seen this over and over again in any RSA. The first round of RSA talks in the cryptographer's track is always full house. And then the second talk is uh, 15 people, you know, 20 people, five people if it's in the morning, that sort of thing. Now, I, I'm terribly sorry if I'm, you know, trying to put you down too much. I, I hope this is not the case. Um, don't worry. I, at the end of the talk, you will understand what happened. But um, so I want to go over several of the problems that, despite this, despite the fact that we have very literate security engineers, this is not about the education or the training or the real life decisions that were made. This is about how come there are still such huge number of failures despite the fact that we have everything ready. So, if there is one sentence you should take from this talk is you should have known better, but don't take it personally, please. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first problem, content distribution problem. Let's assume that you're a Hollywood producer and you want to distribute content, let's say on these plastic discs to consumers, and you want to make sure that there is no piracy. So what do you do? You install a digital rights management system, DRM. And like most of the DRMs, you know, you go to Matt. Matt's company is very um, capable in doing this. So the first solution in all DRMs, you take the content, you encrypt it. Now you have to do something with the key. 
So what you do, you, you somehow encrypt the key that was used to encrypt the content, and you reveal this key only to authorized entities, authorized players. And if you really want to make it into a fancy system, you add some key management, maybe you want to be able to change keys, maybe you want to be able to do traitor tracing to find out who leaked some things. But this is the pyrotechnic, this is not the core essence of, uh, of the solution. And of course you can also put some watermarks, you can do whatever you want. You know which system I'm talking about, right? And you know, we have good encryption. We even have good key distribution mechanisms. And somehow, DVDs were first encrypted using an algorithm which uses 40-bit key. And to top that, you could do an exhaustive key search on this due to some structural flaws in 2 to the 16. Now, for those of you who don't speak the 2 to the sort of language, this is roughly about one second, slightly less, on a very old Pentium 450 megahertz computer, which was the minimal requirement for playing this DVD to begin with. Um, so uh, the problem was that the keys were stored on the DVD using, the, the, they were encrypted using another key, which also was short, and you can say, look, the 40-bit restriction is because of export control. Do you remember the export control? Uh, some of you remember it, some of you don't. Long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away, we had a limit of 40 bits for export control. So whenever you see 40 bits key, it's because of export control issues. Um, but still, it shouldn't have gone down to 2 to the 16. Let me put it this way. So once one of the static keys, the major keys, the root keys were, were found, you could easily extract the DVD's key, and actually you don't really have to, do, to go through all the trouble to find the list of authorized keys, you just find the, the key of the DVD in 2 to the 16 operations, less than one second, and you can get the content with no protection whatsoever, no zones, no nothing. Um, it didn't help a lot afterwards when they increased the number of bits from 40 to 128 bits. So a bit afterwards, uh, in the high definition DVDs and Blu-ray DVDs, the system is slightly different. Then they're using 128-bit keys, and still the 128-bit key is static. It was fixed. Once it was leaked, and you can see it uh, very nice, well, you can see it on the t-shirt, but if you want, you can just Google it. Uh, and again, wonderful story with government intervention and that sort of stuff. But still, everybody can find this 128-bit key. And you can find other keys as well. And look, we, this is a, a problem that we already solved. Um, so first of all, you shouldn't have used static master keys, which are very short. And we should have had better key distribution systems. And we should many, many, many things. Um, and we have to get the adversarial model right. And this is one of the problems that happens quite a lot. We always forget who is the adversary. And in the problem of content distribution is the, the person holding the DVD or holding the device. And uh, those of you who heard one of the game consoles uh, as part of the hacking was put into um, an acid to remove some of the hardware protection so you could change the memory, etc., etc., because Tamper resistance should be tamper resistance against the adversary trying to hack into your system. And not just you say, okay, I, have, I put everything in a tamper resistant hardware and everything is fine. So we have to model uh, our adversaries correctly. Okay, so another problem. I want to discuss the MD5 SHA family. Actually, this family of hash functions, uh, everybody knows what a hash function is, a cryptographic hash function. The three major security requirements, collision resistance, second pre-image resistance, and pre-image resistance. Rings a bell to everyone, right? Good. So, uh, the first design in this family was the MD4 by Revest. Uh, after some attacks on MD4, uh, it was upgraded to MD5. 
Some of you may know it as MD5SAM. It produces 128-bit fingerprint, digital fingerprint. Very hard to uh, uh, fake. And it was, became very popular. Later, it became the base for uh, SHA-0 and SHA-1. But it's very, very, very fast. Less than five cycles per byte. Even on old computers. It was designed by Ron Rivest, not by the NSA, secretly. And we trust Ron Rivest, Rivest anyway, because we're using RSA. So. And actually, there was no co real competition. So this is what we had. But it worked, and it worked wonderfully. And then th things got a bit derailed. Well, there are some problems with the compression function collisions. If you know how hash functions work, there is the compression functions, there is the hash function. Some attacks on the compression functions can be leveraged into attack on the full hash function. But in 93, this attack was not, they couldn't do this leveraging. So they had a simple compression function collision. Then Dobertin in 96 showed the free start collision where you change some parameters, but it's, it's a bit better in sort of, sort of attacks. Then in 2004, uh, Professor Xu Yan Wang just found practical collision attacks on MD5. It took one hour to find a collision in MD5. And there was a pile of papers because of all the new techniques and everything. Everybody improved the results. Klima in 2005 showed how to do it in eight hours, but on a laptop, not on a small cluster. Then Klima and Stevens each found in 2006 method to find collisions in a minute. And you should understand, in, in, in the meantime, the cryptographic community starts shouting. MD5 is insecure. Seriously, MD5 is insecure. Stop using MD5. And we get this response that, you know, maybe for collisions. Collisions don't make sense because these are random collisions and they have structure. And uh, it uses several techniques. And, and you cannot really use these collisions because where do we really use MD5 for security? In signatures. And HMAC, but signatures. And signatures, in order for you to be able to break signatures, you have to break the second pre-image resistance of MD5. And there are no attacks on the second pre-image resistance of MD5. Till today, there are not good attacks. There is some slightly better than exhaustive search attack on MD5. And you, know, you have random collisions. Good for you. And the cryptographic community starts shouting more and more. Because in 2007, Steven Slensra and De Vegger find colliding X501, uh, 509 certificates. Same public key, different distinguished names. So you get two certificates for the price of one. It's mostly a problem for uh, certifying authorities like VeriSign because they lose business. But other than that, OK, so you have colliding X509 certificates. Who cares? And again, the cryptographic community starts shouting more and more, please stop using MD5 for it's important. And we have some uh, password recovery attacks uh, on the APOP protocol, authenticated POP. And then this group of uh, nice people came and announced at the uh, CCC 2008 Chaos Computing Club. Um, here is a certificate signed by Rapid SSL, which is a certifying authority which was owned by VeriSign. So if you trust VeriSign, you trust Rapid SSL as a certif certifying authority. And they succeeded to use MD5 collisions. They improved all the collision finding techniques to the point that they actually held in their hands a real certificate as a certifying authority. Now, there are two types of certificates. As a user, which says this public key belongs to this entity, which is good, but there is an even better one saying that this entity with this public key is a certifying authority in itself. So if you trust VeriSign, therefore you trusted Rapid SSL, therefore you trusted any CA that Rapid SSL decided that it is a CA. So they held in their hands a certificate as a certifying authority. Now, of course, to make everything, uh, let's say, reasonable, they made sure that the certificate had uh, invalid time. 
So nobody could use it. And of course, they hid very well the secret key. Actually, I think if I remember correctly, they said that they completely erased and removed the private key so nobody would be able to actually use this certificate fraudulently. But here is a group of people which used MD5 random collisions. Those that doesn't make any sense and have no implications about security. A bunch of PlayStation 3 and lots of patients. And the fact that Rapid SSL had some very weird behavior concerning several things to the point that they actually held in their hands a valid, they could have held in their hands a valid certificate that would have allowed them to do whatever they want. And if you're worried with governments, this is exactly how the Iranian government or the Chinese government or many other governments uh, read your email even if you're using SSL. There's a very simple meet in the middle attack if you hold in your hand a false certificate, a rogue certificate. How do you get it? Well, you declare yourself as a CA and you sign yourself your certificates. We should have known better. I'm sorry, it's usually you, but we should have known better. It's just that we shouted, we shouted, we, we begged the computer security people to stop doing that, but they continued. So I'm not going to go a lot into a lot of details about web, uh, but the wired equivalent, pri uh, wired equivalent privacy a protocol is just late 90s protocol to give you over the air privacy just like you get on Ethernet, which is known, but for that matter, it was very uh, useful. Very simple uh, challenge response. You have an RC4, you feed in 40 bit key, 24 bit IV, you get a key stream, you use it to XOR the data that you want to XOR. There is a challenge response protocol to authenticate you as a user of the system. You get a challenge, you encrypt it, and this is your response. And there's also some CRC padding, which is used for authentication and for integrity check. And there are several non-cryptanalytic problems. I mean, there are cryptanalytic problems, it's just that we don't really do cryptanalysis in these sort of things. The key is too short, so you can increase the key. But then the IV space is too small, and at some point the IV starts to repeat, which allows you to slowly gather the key stream generated for different IVs. Uh, for each IV, you always get the same key stream. And as an adversary, you know what IV is used because the IV is communicated, so you get this information. It's very easy to change uh, ciphertext, so you could change the plaintext. It's a linear function. And you can easily bypass all the authentication mechanism. And one of the major problems there was the fact that you use a CRC, which is an error correction code, linear error correction code, and then you XOR it for encryption. And these two operations are commutative, but besides that, you know, there is this basic rule that we try to teach in all cryptography courses and all computer security courses. The right order of things is compress, encrypt, authenticate. Okay, so there is no compression here, so what they did, instead of encrypt and authenticate, they, encrypted, they authenticated and then encrypted. Yeah, but okay, that happens. And then uh, I just want to mention that people do do that go to crypto hell. We had Cryptotopia and Cryptaradise, uh, Crypt Paradise. There's also Crypto Hell, and you can pick whatever version of it that you want. This is in Maryland, by the way. Those who need to. <laughs> so a bit afterwards, uh, in 2001, uh, Fleur, Mantin, and uh, Shamir started to show that actually for each key there are weak IVs. And from these weak IVs you can reconstruct the key. This is, or now this is real cryptanalysis. I mean, now we're discussing cryptanalysis. And you can find the key. And it's actually a related key attack. So if anybody tries to convince you that related key attacks have no meaning in real life, all the web attacks are actually related key attacks at the end. And at the beginning they said, okay, give us 4,000 packets. Uh, 4 million, sorry, packets, and we will give you the key. Experiments, it was implemented a bit a few weeks afterwards, show that you need 5 million packets. Okay, so you just wait a bit more and you collect the data. Um, and there are today many, many improvements, and you can find it in, even in software packages. Those of you know Aircrack, Aircrack Next Generation, 
You can just download Wet Cracker today. It's very simple to do. And today there is even an attack by uh, uh, Puyan, Serge, and Martin uh, that requires only 4,000 packets, which means that you just listen for a few seconds to some web communications and you already have the key. Um, and there are several more anecdotes, and I mean, this is only a very short list. Uh, Nadia talk about all the problems with lack of entropy in key generation, and we have Debian lacks of, of uh, sufficient entropy when you generate keys, and hard disk encryption. I actually was once suggested to buy an encrypted hard drive. It will do the security, military level security, this is how they like to sell it, AS-256, which is good. It's just that they used ECB for encryption. There is a special section in Crypto Hell for those who encrypt using ECB. Huge bulks of data. The reason is that each block is encrypted independently, and this is bad. This is really, really bad. You never encrypt using ECB. GSM 3G security. We have weak algorithms. We have, again, first of all, error correction, and then encryption. And everything is linear, so you're commutative, and you can do whatever you want. Uh, the control channel is not authenticated at all, meaning that if I want to tell your cell phone to do something, I can do it, which is amazingly secure. Uh, people are still using ciphers from the 80s. MIFR, if you're riding the Boston uh, public transportation systems, you're using MIFR. Still, if you're uh, entering your car or your garage with a keylock remote keyless entry system, you're still using a cipher from the 80s. 64-bit key today. Okay. This is well, only recently was uh, removed from interbank communications in the US. It's relatively new. If this talk would have been four years ago, many years after we had AES, many years after we had, I, would, could, I, I could tell you that this is still being used in real systems. And today they're using triple DES. People are still making up their crypto algorithms. I thought that we, we went beyond, beyond that, but apparently not. Uh, MD5 is still used in the context of, context of digital signatures. There are applications which are signed using MD5 signatures. MD5 hash function, and then you sign. Hmm? You don't want to know. It's very disturbing. Um, there are developers who say, okay, you can keep these keys, the secret keys, let's put them in the memory, but don't, you have to declare it to the operating system that this memory should not be swapped out. Because otherwise the key is taken from the memory, written to the hard drive at the swap area, and afterwards if somebody is reading your swap area, he has the keys. So you need to do that. And people are still using broken standards and protocols and everything is, in other words, we are in really, really uh, problematic situation, given the fact that we're in such a golden era. I mean, we can solve most of these problems. Okay, and now for something completely different. After bashing security engineers for the last 30 minutes, I would like to apologize. The reason I would like to apologize is the fact that actually uh, I'm exaggerating a bit the way the cryptographic community looks at security engineers and says, you know, you, you guys, screw things up. We give you such lovely constructions, and then you take them to the real world, and you screw things up. And you know, we solved all the problems. We, we, we do research in cryptography just because it's interesting for us, not because there is a real need for that, you know. It, it, it makes a bit of a problem when you write a grant application, because all the real problems were solved, and we have to make up new problems, but, you know, we, we can try and somehow sell it. So, Actually, I would like to say that not all of the problems are because of the security engineers. There's actually a huge pile of problems that come from the fact that the cryptographers um, do not really know what's going on. So some of the problems are just the way cryptographers see the world. Because we have our own vision of how, how things work. Some of these problems are actually because the way the information propagates from the users of the security products through the security engineers into the, the cryptographic circles, something is lost in translation. And some of it is just plain cryptographers should have known better. So 
I would like to give you the first example is the RC4 stream cipher, you know, the one from WEP, we just seen it. Theoretically, if you look very carefully at RC4, the first thing that we teach you, or one, one of the first few things, because there are already five first things, is that never create your own crypto algorithms, right? You should pick a good algorithm, well-known, well-analyzed, well-understood cipher. RC4 was designed by a distinguished member of our community. It went through lots and lots and lots and lots of analysis. Up until today, there is no real key recovery attack on RC4. It passed through huge amounts of statistical tests. Not that it means anything, but it is a cipher, well deployed, well understood. Uh, there is a bit of an issue whether it was the alleged RC4. I'm not going to get into this. Um, it's a very basic cipher, easy to implement. You have all the good reasons, if you need a stream cipher today, to go and use RC4. And before I continue, did any of you, if, if, did any of you knew of the problems with RC4? Are, are there people here in this audience who know about the statistical problems of RC4? Uh, cryptographers do not count, I'm sorry. This, in, in this, in this. How many of you know what RC4 is? <laughs> Those of you who know, have you heard about the problems in RC4? Are there people in the audience who know what RC4 is and never heard about the problems in RC4? Okay, so RC4 has statistical problems. And what's surprising, mo most surprising I think, um, is the fact that the biases are not inside the stream. If you have a stream cipher, you put in a key and you get a key stream. And all the statistical tests that we used to have were take many keys, generate many key streams, and check each key stream that it looks pseudo-random enough that the number of zeros is the number of ones, is the number of twos, the number of threes. Now, very early there were some complaints about some statistical biases in one key stream. Okay, very small statistical distances. They could be used only for distinguishing purposes, not for key recovery. You couldn't recover the plain text. Okay, there's some small statistical imbalance happens. But then people started to look what happens in the second byte of the key stream over many, many key streams. And it was found out that even though this is, if you look at the second byte, it should be about 1 over 256 of the times 0, almost with twice the probability it was 0. And this was actually the uh, Mantin and Shamir's observation that led to the attack on web. If you take many, many, many key streams of different keys, and you look at the second byte, there is a bias. It's going to be biased towards zero. There are several other biases. Uh, there, is a, there is a slight difference towards zero. Slight uh, bias towards zero. Uh, the second byte is two with probability lower than what we would expect. There's several others. There's actually a series of papers proving and finding and analyzing and doing lots of things with RC4. If you use RC4 just for the encryption of one session, this does not affect you. But the moment you're using broadcast, you send the same message over and over and over again, you're going to lose all security. And there is a recent paper by, um, I uh, forgot his name, a group, uh, terribly sorry, remember Bernstein and uh, Kenneth Patterson and several others, I forgot the first name, uh, first author, that actually if you take 2 to the 32 random RC4s, uh, 2 to the 32 random RC4 keys, so if you have a server that sends quite a lot of broadcast information, you can deduce the first 256 bytes of the plaintext if you encrypt the same plaintext under that many different keys with probability one, even in SSL, even when the key length is 256 bits, even, 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 all the good things that we would have expected. And this is not because of security engineers. We should have, I mean, RC4 is a legitimate design selection. 
you could not foresee this. I mean, if you try to develop a cipher similar to RC4, you would not expect these sort of things, but we could have tested for them. And statistical tests, even though they're not, uh, they don't give uh, exact information, the, there should have been statistical tests that could find it. And the result is even though that RC4 is considered to be secure, and I guess some of you, if you were asked to implement something based on a stream cipher, you would have gone and picked RC4, and you would have done correctly. It's just that we tricked you. We put this high-profile cipher and told everybody, you use only high-profile ciphers because it's more secure. OK. Uh, questions? OK, so I want to go very quickly over advanced encryption standard, the AES. There was a big competition. Reindel won. was designed in Belgium by a bunch of uh, two by a bunch, by two Belgians. Um, the, security, the security of AS was analyzed against almost any attack you can think of in cryptanalysis. And to this day, unless you have a very special attack scenario, related subkey model in some, if you don't know what it is, good for you. It saves a headache. And um, besides a very small reduction in the case of exhaustive search, AS is secure. If you ask me today what block cipher to use, there are two answers, Serpent or AES. Pick one. Now, roughly, sp roughly speaking, this is how it works. You take the plain text of 16 bytes, you put it in a 4 by 4 matrix. First, you apply on each byte independently a sub-byte transformation. It takes each byte and transforms 8 bits into 8 bits using some nonlinear operation. Then you do some shift rows, which shifts the byte in each row in some cyclic shift. Then you have a mixed column, which is an algebraic operation. You take four bytes, you multiply them by a matrix over some field. Doesn't really matter. And then at the end, you XOR the round subkey. So this is AES. For performance reasons, usually what you do, shift rows is just reordering bytes. So if you store everything in an array of bytes, it's just changing the indices. So you don't really have to implement this operation. What you have to implement is the sub-bytes, the mixed columns, and the add round key. Um, and what you usually do, you just combine the sub-bytes with the mixed column. You can do it. I'm not going to get into too much details how to do it. But at the end, you get four tables from 8 bits to 32 bits, which are called in each round uh, four times. And this is how you implement AES in the most efficient way. You can reach very high speeds using that method. It's a general method. Everybody are using it. Everything is great. It was in OpenSSL. You could, I mean, real security libraries. There is a small problem which requires a fifth table. The last round has no mixed column operation. So for spe specifically for the last round, there is a, a fifth table of 8 bits to 8 bits. Now, OK. Everybody are happy? Well, in the general life, I mean, AES is okay with you. Everybody are content. AES is good. Good. So, as I mentioned, this table is accessed only on the last uh, round. And a series of papers, starting with uh, Dan Page in 2002, and then Bernstein, and then Oswick, uh, Shamir, and Tromer show that you can actually gain quite a lot of information by looking at the cache access patterns. What happens is that in the last round, you access a very specific table. And if you remember how memory works, you have this uh, CPU with registers. And then there is a cache, L1 cache, and then level 2 cache and then RAM or level 3 cache or whatever. And the further you get from the CPU, it takes more time to access the memory. This is the entire von Neumann approach on how to do things efficiently. But if, for example, I flush out the, the cache as an adversary, I'm running on the machine, I'm flushing out the cache. I'm just filling the cache with my data. When the algorithm will be called, to execute, when the AS algorithm will be executed, its tables will be loaded into cache. 
when they are loaded into the cache, they are going to evacuate my entries. And when I will try to access the entries, I will be able to detect whether my entry was removed from the cache or not removed from the cache. Because the timings will, are going to be different, and I'm timing my own accesses. So if I will be able to look at the fifth table, access patterns, which areas, and you know, memory is always aligned, there are alignment issues, and everything is aligned correctly, so I know exactly where this table is going to be loaded to, so I know exactly where to look for the missing entries. Now, if you tell me these missing entries, which I just told you I can find them, it actually means I know which entries of the S-Box were accessed in the last round. Meaning I can tell you information about the partial decryption of the ciphertext. Because I know the value, I know which entry we got into. I'm not getting into all the technical details, but in theory I get information which entries were accessed. I know the value after the access because the tables are publicly, publicly available. And I just have to extra these th two things, the value that I obtained from the cache information and the ciphertext. The XOR of the two is the key. And you can actually find a full AES 128-bit key in 65 nanoseconds of measurements. 65 nanoseconds. 2 to the 128, which is the exhaustive search time on AES, would take several billions of years on a normal machine. And we're discussing 65 nanoseconds. We tricked you. On behalf of the cryptographic community, I would like to apologize by making you believe that AES is secure. And so it's a very uh, easy attack. And it's actually a bunch of the side channel attacks. There is a, a pile of attacks which actually gain information not from the algorithms. The algorithms, algorithms that we have today are secure enough. Not RC4, but all the rest. It's just that the implementation leaks information about the key, either via execution time or memory accesses patterns, and even through the branch prediction. So you know that in one of the optimizations of CPUs is to have branch prediction. The CPU predicts which branch is going to happen, starts computing this branch, and if afterwards it finds out that, well, the branch was incorrect, it flushes the, the data path, and resumes the computation. So there is a t this TLB, it's called a table that tries to predict it. And actually, you can control it if you craft your ciphertext correctly. And uh, Bumbley and, I'm sorry, Bumbley and, mm -hmm. in 2011, they showed that you can recover an ECDSA secret key remotely not internally on the system, remotely, by measuring the time differences between several ciphertexts. It took them only a few minutes to retrieve the secret key. They still had to be in the local area network. But if you're sitting in Amazon's EC2 farm, and next to you there is your competitor's uh, machine, you're on the same LAN, so you can still find the secret key, it's disturbing. And there are also other sort of uh, side channel attacks. For example, in hardware attacks, you have power attacks, and you have a simple and differential, and you have template attacks, and acoustics attacks, and ele electromagnetic radiation. You can actually do some of these attacks from the distance. And the thing is to remember is don't only pick a secure cipher, a secure algorithm. You also have to pick secure implementation. How many of you heard this before? How many of you hear it for the first time? OK, so the situation is not that bad. But sometimes it is. So going very quickly over padding, another problem. This is how RSA is taught. Of course, if you use this sort of RSA, you will find yourself at crypto hell, because you shouldn't use it. There is padding. And for example, for encryption, you should use something which is like the RSA OEP which is way more complicated, and there is a reason for that. 
There is also a reason to do the padding correctly. If you fail with the padding, you're going to have bad time. If you're going to give different error messages, depending whether your decryption failed at the padding or failed at parsing the answer after the padding was correct, you're going to, be, to have even worse time. And the reason for that, uh, Bleichenbecher showed in uh, 1998 a very simple padding attack. I'm not going to give you the full details, but the con general concept is in PKCS, a very famous standard, you should have picked PKCS version 1 in 98. The plain text has the form byte of 1, then some random bytes, something, and then the message M that you want to send. It's a very simplified version. And then you raise everything to the power of E. You send it to the other side, it decrypts, so computes to the power of D, checks that the first byte is one, that the padding is correct, everything works well. And then it, process, it, it passes the information for parsing afterwards according to the message. Now, what will happen if I will send instead of this message, this message using the multiplicative uh, property of uh, RSA, it's, I'm actually sending this. So the message is decrypted, the padding is wrong, I get an error message or padding is wrong. Well, I'm timing the time it takes to get the error message. If the padding was right, it would have moved to another layer that actually reads the data. So instead of you know, multiplying it by 2, I will multiply it by 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to the power of e. If it affected the 1 at the beginning, then I will get error in the decryption. Otherwise, it will be moved to the other layer, and I can time the differences. And therefore, I can observe whether the multiplication here caused an overflow to this one, which means that I actually know that this value m is not too large. And I can start playing with this constant and slowly finding the message m for a ciphertext that I have no idea what's written in there, but just observing when the oracle, uh, when the padding oracles uh, gives me the wrong answers. It takes about 10 to the, 10 to the 6 queries to find a PKCS version 1.5 message. Uh, it also works for uh, CBC, for symmetric key. I'm not going, we don't really have much time for that. Um, but the point here is that even if you take provably secure constructions that we provided you, PKCS version 1.5 has security proof. We can prove to you that it's indistinguishable in the CCA adversarial model, I think maybe even CCA2, you get all the promises that we can give you. It's just that it doesn't work. Um, cold boot attacks, well, we heard a lot about it, so I'm not going to go into that. It's just that there's huge amounts of leakage. There is even a panel in Crypto 2011, I think it was about leakage. And leakage is a very hot word, maybe 2010. Leakage is the most important thing in crypto, it used to be the, very, the hottest topic in cryptography for a while. Everybody were working on their leakage resilient uh, implementations. We had leakage resilient encryption signatures under continuous leakage, single case leakage. Everything was leakage. And this is a problem that came from the real world. Security engineers told us, look, here is this cold boot attack. Can, can you help us with that? And we came to the rescue Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, until um, five uh, researchers showed in Eurocrypt 2011 that actually all this leakage resilience constructions assume something which is incorrect about modern technology. It has to do with small, when you go below 65 nanometers, the technology is such that independent computations are not really independent. Long story short. This was the security proof behind it, saying everything is going to be secure against leakage because when you compute 
two different things, you will get two independent measurements. But technology, in other words, real life, had different uh, points of view. And uh, Francois Javier is one of the authors. Um, so we did some more issues. We have some issues with authentication. Please use authentication. Please use authentication. This is something very important. So let's go into the future. We need a better future, which means somehow closing the gap between these two communities who are not that hostile to each other. I mean, you know, we have this joke about how you take a failed PhD student and make him into a good security into sorry, how you take a failed PhD student and you make him into a professor in university. You hit him on the head, but not too much, so he won't end as a security engineer. So I am kidding, we don't have this. <laughs> it's just that there is a gap. The communities should not be hostile. They are not hostile. It's just that each of them is dealing with a different problem. And each of them thinks that we're dealing, each of them deals with the real world. It's just that the definition of real and world is not the same, and we should somehow communicate better these things. We don't see many cryptographers. And this is true in standardization bodies. Uh, for example, Israel is not represented in ISO when it comes to cryptographic, uh, cryptographic standards. Effect. Um, we need better ways of communicating these differences back and forth. And it would actually be a good idea if cryptographers will start not only giving the algorithms, but also the software or the system. Because you know, it's very nice to sit in the academia and we do wonderful things. And now I'm going back to the cryptographers. Don't feel attacked. I'm not attacking the cryptographers. I'm a cryptographer myself, sort of. So this is not an attack. It's somehow a call to try and bridge the gaps. And we should actually meet more often. Several things so that we should take into consideration. Fault-tolerant design. It's very important. You know, they tell you, collect your garbage in the memory. It's very important. But also, when you fail, make sure that you remove all the secret keys that you stored. Be aware of that. I mean, it's a very basic rule, but not everybody are doing that. Key agility design. When you design new protocols, new products, new everything, don't fix. Uh, if you know the trusted, trusted uh, computing group, so the TPMs inside trusted computing group are hardwired for 124-bit RSA keys. Makes very little sense to have all your standards fixed on the size of the key. OK, you fixed RSA, that's understandable. But make sure that you can do something uh, agile. Crypto algorithm agility, it's very important. Don't fix yourself on one stream cipher. Today, RC4 is the king. Tomorrow, RC4 is not secure. Make sure that your algorithms, your protocols, your system can easily transform from one cryptographic primitive to the other. It's very important. And better generic libraries, OpenSSL today has, first of all, protections against Nadia's attack. It has protections against cache attacks. Today you can find uh, implementations which are fast, actually even faster than the table-based approach, and secure against side channel attacks. There are several things going on. Actually, this is not just, uh, you know, Everything is bad, catastrophe. No, there are quite a lot of initiatives trying to bridge the gaps. We have the scissor competition for authenticated encryption, and the cryptographic community now is in the mood of competitions. Just give us something to compete about, and we will compete about. Uh, so now it's authenticated encryption. There is the SALT library. There are OpenSSL people, people working on OpenSSL, improving various things. We know that there is some problem with patents, especially when it comes to hard disk encryption. There are patents. Um, we try to solve it to some extent, you know, to the best of our knowledge. Um, there should be inclination towards this sort of things, both in standards and protocol and in research. And there are several uh, crypto in the real world sort of events. There is the real world cryptography workshop, which was held in 2011 and 13 and is going to be next year as well. A very large uh, event. There is the international state of the art in cryptography and computer security. 
and this joins the Eurocrypt, Crypto, Asia Crypt, our, all the regular conferences that we have, and Usenix, there are some cryptographers going to Usenix, and the chess and crypto conferences, chess are the hardware people and crypto is usually the theoretical people, they're going to be co-located again in Santa Barbara, Barbara this year, so we expect some more uh, collaboration. Of course, we have things like the summer school, which force you to listen to weird people discussing weird problems. And we should work a bit about slightly more realistic attack models, but this requires the security engineers to actually give us feedback. Look into the cryptographic papers and say, look, this assumption about what the adversary can do or not do makes no sense or does not make enough sense. The adversary is much stronger. And if you open any cryptanalytic paper today, it starts with some adversarial model, which usually makes no sense. But then somebody finds a way to make it into something which is real. So thank you very much. Thank you.